joining us today. Uh, I'm Tracy Royko from Connector and I'm with Matt Love, my business partner, and we're joined today by Nick Brax. So for those of you that haven't uh, heard about what Nick is doing lately, he has uh, just begun a new podcast called Move Your Mind. He's also um, developed a mental health masterclass and he's a mental health speaker and advocate. So I wanted to bring Nick on today to talk about um, mental health in construction. So we know that there's a lot of pressure put on people um, in the construction industry. I was just saying to Nick that I, I believe that it's actually construction is like in the top three um, in terms of industry when it comes to people that experience mental health concerns, whether that be anxiety or whether that be um, depression. So there's also issues around uh, substance abuse. I think construction is the highest, um, has the highest incidence of substance abuse out of any industry. I think it sits somewhere at around 12%. And one in five of people in the construction industry experience anxiety. We also know that um, in construction, it, because of the long hours that you guys work, because of um, the time that you spend away from, from your family and friends, in you know working six, maybe seven hours a day, um, possibly, especially in um, professional construction where you're managing million dollar projects, you're ma managing many, many people um, underneath you, you're, you're spending, you know, lots of hours on site and you've also got the responsibility of money and lives as well. So a lot of pressure there. So welcome, Nick. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me today. And I think it's a really important topic that uh, you're discussing, like you're saying, you know, mental health in general is an enormous issue. Mental health before coronavirus is a big issue, mm. uh, but it's been elevated and in the construction industry, uh, it, it's problematic. And for a lot of reasons you've said, for reasons of, you know, values that have been instilled and um, cultures that have been instilled over many years that need to change. And it, it, it's a difficult thing to change these cultures, but we need to be making that shift. So I think it's a, a really important conversation that, you know, we're having today about this. I agree. And I think that there's, um we're still in an industry that is mainly um, male dominated. It's mostly made up of men. And we all know that Australian men have been uh, raised to be um, tough, to not show their emotions, not express how they're feeling um, with people, not, not talk to people about what's going on inside of them. So I think that it's really important that you're here today as a man who has experienced mental health concerns yourself. So um, if you would uh, be kind enough, we would love to hear about where you came from and what your journey was to mental wellness. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're saying, um, it is, there's a lot more awareness about it, but for men, we need to understand that there's no difference if you're a male or a female. Uh, we all experience emotions. We all like in physical health. It's like saying... Um, a man is not going to have a physical issue for their whole life. Of course we are. Of course we're all going to have a mental health related issue. We might not be suffering from clinical depression. Some people will, but everyone's going to have some sort of issue with their mental wellbeing. Um, and I fell into this area through my own um, hardship. I, I bat battled anxiety and severe anxiety and OCD and a whole range of things growing up and went off the rails after I'd finished school and, it was through, eventually I was lucky enough to um, have the support around me to, to get through that. Uh, and not long after that period, I wound up working uh, in the, me being in the media. I was on um, a television show at the time and that led to me having an avenue to speak about it. And I was really nervous and, you know, I was still dealing with my own issues and I was uncomfortable and scared to be vulnerable. And I did it because I was seeing how big of an issue it was. And the more I kept doing that I um every single time whether I went to school an organization spoke one-on-one -on -one to someone spoke at an event every single time there would be someone coming out of the woodworks and going and getting help and uh it just I, I've been doing that for 10 years now and I now run a, a seminar company I I do awareness work I've got you know a podcast I've got programs and 
um, I'm really just trying to get that message out there as far and wide as I can because it does help people. And, and, and the thing I always say with this work and the same as this conversation right now, if this can just help one person, then it's 100% worth it. And that's, you know, we don't need to try and change the world here. We need to just try and do, you know, make sure every day we're trying to do things that can help hopefully just one person even. If more people get help, that's great. But if we only help one person, then it's all worthwhile. Mm. And I, I find it very courageous what you're doing. And there's, there have been many people that have experienced the same thing as yourself, um, have gone on to wellness, but have not felt the, um, the calling or the urge to go out there and actually help people outside of themselves. That, and there's no judgment on that. It's just that that's not, you know, that's not their thing. What drives you? What make, made you work through the nervousness of speaking out and being vulnerable and showing people inside who you are um, to go out there and, and help that one person? Um, for me, a big part of it was understanding myself and, um, you know, having to deal with my own because it, it was a, became a personal thing for me where I could relate on such a level to it. Um, and having to, you know, then go on my own journey to create um, a healthy lifestyle for myself, what I realised was, hang on, this is something that we're not educated about in school. We're not educated about it in companies. We're not educated about it in society. Our parents don't educate us about this. We're not given the tools to deal with this. And I had to deal with it through hardship. And, yes, sir, there are really important things. We need to go and see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, get professional help. All that sort of side is really critical. Um, the area I'm interested in is how on a day-to-day -day basis can we actually do practical things that help us because we can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we're not willing to actually implement stuff daily, we're not going to make a change. And I realized that through having to do it on myself and seeing different psychologists and all that kind of thing. And the thing that has actually worked for me long-term was doing things through trial and error and finding what worked. And they're all very simple things, but the, the thing that keeps driving me is this, you know, knowledge and passion to try and make this a more mainstream thing and get the message out there because um, the more you look into it, the more um, surprising it, it is that there's not, you know, more um, resource out there for, you know, this area. I think you hit the nail on the head that... Um and I'm a parent myself. I'm also um, someone who has experienced extreme anxiety. And up until I was in my early 40s, um, I didn't know what that that's what I was experiencing. And I've had the last seven years of a really long, um, interesting inner journey to wellness um, myself. And as a parent, the catalyst for me was actually seeing that I was developing the same traits in my son. He was learning all my OCD behaviour, he was learning my anxious behaviour, um, he was learning all my beliefs around what I thought made a good person versus what didn't make a good person and an, and an unlikable person. Mm -hmm. Hence, I started making the changes for myself. And when you say, had said before that you're, you, you know, you weren't taught or a lot of people aren't taught because their parents don't know, it's only because our our parents and the people before us weren't educated by anyone because no one knew it yeah. yeah so voices like you out in the community saying hey let's start thinking about um learning about this and and integrating this into this wellness mm -hmm. um looking after ourselves into our our life is really really important mm -hmm. um I don't think it's up to our schools to do it. I think it's up to, our, you know, ourselves and our parent, you know, parents of young kids today and kids, teenagers, learning this information from someone like yourself that they look up to. Um, I think that you're, I, I don't know if I can highly recommend uh, the, the advertisements that Nick has put together and in what anxiety feels like and, you know, those ads, I think we might link to some of them at the end of this. I thought they were really I amazing because... That is what anxiety feels like. I know because I've had it. So, like, that's it. you've hit the nail on the head. It was just amazing. So, yeah, what it shows is that you're not alone if that's what you're experiencing because you know what it feels like. Other people, and if you can relate to it, then 
you know that other people are, are relating to it as well. So absolutely. So can I ask about, um, we briefly talked about uh, what you're doing in construction in particular mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what people might be able to access uh, for themselves. Yeah, so um, I, I'm working with uh, John Holland. So they're sponsoring the podcast. We've just launched a, a new podcast called Move Your Mind with Nick Brax and it's available um, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Acast and We'll put links, hopefully. Um, we'll link anyone, to, yeah. yeah, anyone who wants to listen after this. Um, and uh, John Holland have come on board uh, because they, you know, are really taking a, a, um, a they want to be at the forefront of trying to help in internally in their organisation, but also externally in getting these messages out there about the construction industry. Um, you know, they've obviously seen firsthand how big of an issue of mental health is in that industry. And they're just wanting to really be able to work on getting those messages out there and, um, you know, getting, helping educate people about what needs to be done in, in that area. So uh, I've been very fortunate to work with them and we're um, already, you know, we've, we've released just the fifth episode um, yesterday and we're getting really good feedback. We're hearing so many people get value out of um, the content that we're putting out there. And um, I think it's just such an important thing and the, the whole concept of this show is it's just about having real and authentic conversations and every week we're um either speaking to a celebrity such as we um yesterday's one was with Manu Fildel who's a celebrity chef in Australia um got different sort of actors and entertainers and people from a whole range of industries but um rather than talking about their career per se it's more about having a really honest and authentic conversation with them about what have you been through? What were some hardships you had to deal with? Um, what did you learn? What can we give to the listener? Um, and then the other side of it is we're bringing on different wellness experts from around the world to um, also drill into specific topics. Um, so that's sort of the, the concept of it. And, uh, you know, it's a continuation of the work that I've been doing through. I've got a program called Mental Health Masterclass, which um, is a more uh, comprehensive video-based learning tool and it has habit formation toolkits and it's really a summary of you know a lot of the stuff I speak about mm -hmm. but putting it into action as well so we have programs like that but yeah with the with the podcast it's it's really just about in on, on a mainstream level getting this message out there globally is as far and wide as we can um, so you know that's our goal because again we need you know the, the message needs to get a, to get out there to help people Yes, I think so. I, I agree. The message that you're not alone and, and normalising it rather than we talk a lot about removing the stigma. I think that if we just normalise that this is how the human mind works, this is how our brains behave and these are the reasons why and this is how you can change that or manage that. Um, yeah, so. exactly. Um, I also talked to someone, so for anyone um, that's actually running a, any of our clients or anyone that's actually running a construction company. I had an interesting chat with um, Sarah uh, Cascaden from ProBuild, um, who's the uh, health and safety um, group manager at ProBuild. She had discussed, which I, I thought was amazing as well, that um, she's done a lot of work in, in obviously trying to make safety on site um, in, improvements for everyone, so to keep everyone safe while they're um, at work. Mm -hmm. But what she's found through her um, research and um, and investigation is that the healthier people are in themselves, in their mental health and wellness, the better on-site um, safety is. So um, they've kind of started programs that work on mental health mm -hmm. as the starting point for on-site safety so that's an that's a I thought that was actually really really interesting um yeah. and something that obviously John Holland is is onto it as well so they're already working with you um mm -hmm. I know that some of the other um that there's many companies out there that already have um this kind of stuff but there is a definite link between mm -hmm. mental health and wellness and safety on site so something worth thinking about yeah so one hundred percent. I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go. I was yep. just going to say, just quickly. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think just basically, you know, in simple terms, 
if you improve mental health in any area, it's going to have a positive effect on, you know, safety, on uh, performance, on the bottom line, on, you know, people's home life, just everything really. Like it's a, it's, it, it, it's such an important thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We, um, we talk a lot these days about um, work-life balance, um, but yeah. I think I think there's a bit of a misconception in that that it should be half and half. You should spend half your time at work and more time at home, and you know these these um, working from home days mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I believe that work life balance is being happy and fulfilled at work and happy and fulfilled at home. So whatever that means to you. So you know my my values are not your values. So um, it doesn't need to be half mm. home, half at work. I just think as long as you're looking after your um, mental health, feeling fulfilled, feeling valued in the workplace, that obviously that makes a massive difference for you know um, the amount of re- return rate on your investment of your your employees, um, as well as you know making a difference with safety making a difference with you know just happiness in the workplace and happiness at home as well yeah absolutely yeah I think it's um and I think it's yeah it's a flawed way of thinking of trying to um uh categorize things in you know this work-life balance that I can only you know it's only about when I'm not at work that I can enjoy my life or yeah in a piece like well you know we life we spend so much time working and fair enough some people don't have the luxury of doing work that they necessarily do love or enjoy and I get that but we've got to find some way to make it more of a you know enjoyable environment to be and if you're going to spend that much time there it's you know it's really important to at least try and find how can we navigate that yeah yeah and I think it's I think it's also part of um some a lot of the time we put the the onus on the employer um, to make all this, and, and some of it sits with the employer, but there's a lot of, you know, I, I would encourage people to take back onus themselves yeah. to navigate their own life, to actually fulfil their own needs as well and, you know, um, take a stand for themselves, take control back. Um, there's so much help out there that you can that you can get in terms of finding fulfilment or maybe working on mental health and wellness there's free stuff there's your podcast there's your um mental health masterclass that they can um i'll also put a link for you guys to get in, in contact with us if you're interested in doing um in becoming involved in, in nick's masterclass as well so um i guess for me the big thing that is just families and juggling families and work and things like that that's obviously the, the main re- or one of the main reasons for poor mental health in construction yeah, people are doing seventy hours a week, coming home, and the wife's got three kids. She's knackered, and you're knackered, and it's just not a recipe for productive sort of. I don't know a product a productive conversation, is it, or productive life, or it's it, it, yeah. yeah. I guess it's I guess strategies for dealing with that is probably as I'm sure that John Holland are probably telling you similar things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, that's Do you like, have any particular strategies around that, Nick? Yeah, I mean, we in the program we've got things. So um, a lot of it, uh, I guess, is about just finding, I mean, if there's things you can't avoid and you're working crazy hours like that, I think it's making, the, the number one thing I sort of talk about is, you know, making daily habits that are healthy for you and um it's like what you said before everyone's different everyone responds differently to things everyone's got different capability of what they can stick to so it's like being able to look at okay well based on all of this here what is something that I could stick to and that's going to be healthy for me and it might be you know meditate for five minutes a day for one person or it might be exercising for an hour a day for the other person or someone else that might be having half an hour where they are able to tune out from everything and just listen to music or whatever it is. But I, I think the first step's like acknowledging, looking at everything and thinking, what is it that's actually going to help me? Okay. Um, in an ideal world, what would that look like? Um, is that practical for me to fit into my daily routine? Maybe it's not. What is practical based on that then? And then making a really um, 
rigid plan around actually making it a habit because the problem is, and you, you said it before, um, there's so much content out there. There's great resources. There's free content everywhere. We're not lacking knowledge or mm. resource. What we're lacking is actually taking action. You know, yeah. and and people that people get overwhelmed, and you know, you can have the best intentions, and I see it all the time in companies I work in. People get excited, and they try and you know, they might go almost too hard for the first week or two at trying to create yeah. this habit, and then it becomes, you know, a bit of a chore for them or not practical and they stop. So it's like, that's what I really think is so important, being able to um, find something that's sustainable that yeah. can help you, you know, date. Because there's things we can't control. You can't, I guess some people can't control. I mean, maybe you can. Maybe you can ask if you can find a different, restructure your position or something. But if you can't, then you actually have something you've got to work around. So, um it's so important that we, you know, do these daily things that are healthy for us. So I think yeah. that's, yeah, probably one I'd say. And, and kind of being a bit preventative as opposed to um, preventative. responsive once you're already yeah, yeah. down the rabbit hole. It's a bit harder to claw back from versus doing things to prevent getting there in the first place. Well, it's the thing. It's like... um I think everything should be preventative. It shouldn't, it, you, I mean, none of this stuff you should be doing because, you know, I'm working 70 hours a week and I'm burnt out and I need a solution. It should be, I, I, I want to just feel good and do things that help. Because it's like saying, um, I'm not, I'm going to wait to exercise until I have a heart attack. It's like, well, why not try and, you know, just yeah. for yourself to feel and good and, you know, get more out of life do it now not not because you're trying to um you know stop something negative from happening just so you can actually get more out of life and then the byproduct of that is when something difficult does arise you're you've got these you know techniques to fall back on to, to help with so um yeah, i think people need i think it's intangible the mental health side people find it more difficult to um you know to to sort of see what they to do the preventative things yeah um Whereas something tangible like exercise, it's like pretty clear to them. So it's yeah. trying to find ways to make it palatable to, for people. I think it's also interesting because we, as a business, were discussing um, just yesterday, I think, Matt, about how set in its patterns construction is and that it's a, it's a difficult mm. ship to change direction, to to. You know, because it, you know, we were having a, a heated discussion about whether we can implement change in, in construction or whether people are just, they won't accept it. And yeah. I think that because I just think we're in the 21st century, it's time we, we understand that mental health is really important in people's lives. And instead of saying this, this ship is too big to change course, that we start just demanding it's time to change and let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think unless you do that, it's so hard. Like, I, I work really um, comprehensively with, um, like, a big manufacturing company in the past, and we sort of went to every site doing talks. And, you know, just it's the same thing, seeing how um, embedded the culture was. It's, like, it's such a huge thing to try and – it's so complicated, isn't it, to try and yeah. change it? It like, is, yeah. but if you don't start, you don't start. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time today, Nick. It was amazing talking to you. I love your story. I actually, as I told you already, I did not know who you were uh, when I first reached out to you. I just thought what you were doing was amazing and I, I thought I need to get involved in this somehow. Um, and because at, for Connector, that's something that's obviously close to my heart um, and really important to our business. So thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you for reaching out and um, I am enjoyed having the chat and chatting to you. Um, leading up to this as well and uh you know love the fact that you're really making the push to help in, in this area and you know it's really good to have the conversation so thanks for uh inviting me here to have a chat yeah.